I wanted to do this introduction because I've read a lot of Moises Naim, and he stretches my thinking, and he recognizes the power is dynamic, not static. I'm sure he will tell us about his 3Ms, which is not a Minneapolis corporation, uh, but uh, dealing with more and mobility and, um, and mentality. Um, and how power is easier to get, harder to use, and even easier to lose. And I think we are happy to have you here, and let's welcome Moises Naim. Thanks for that very kind uh, introduction. Thank you all. Um, you, you are my kind of people. You know, people who are willing to come to a bookstore on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, it's, to talk about books is my kind of people. So thank, thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, I'll try to be brief, and so we can have a conversation more than, than a uh, long lecture. Uh, the, this is a story of power. Um, this is a story of what's happening to power. The central idea, as was already mentioned, is that uh, there's a mutation of power uh, in which it's becoming har harder to use, far more constraints on those that have power, and it's more fleeting. It's, um, it, people, it's, has it's, everything is more slippery at the top now. It's slippery at the top for CEOs and for the Pope and for um, the military forces and for uh, presidents and cabinet members. Uh, turnover rates of the powerful uh, are now much higher. I, when I was writing the book, I was very self-conscious and insecure and uh, doubtful because I knew for two reasons. One, because I was talking about power. And this is a big subject that has been dealt with by, in, in history, you know, start with the Bible and before the Bible and after the Bible. Power has been the theme of uh, some of the greatest minds uh, in, in history. And I felt very humbled by that. And therefore, I decided that my only hope was to let the data talk. And instead of uh, just uh, giving my opinions, I would just rely on numbers and statistics and facts and, and evidence. The other uh, very self-conscious uh, feeling I had when writing the book is that I was saying things that were going counter uh, the general conversation, and that is that power is concentrating, that uh, inequality of wealth, inequality of income has become uh, more acute, uh, that the, the wealthy have more and therefore have more power, and with more power uh, and money there is more opportunity to buy politicians and, and, and uh, distort public policy in ways that re reinforces the trends towards inequality. So I was aware that that was the conversation. I was aware, you know, the whole 1% and 99% uh, um, debate and everything that came with that. So I was aware that I was saying things that would uh, uh, go against what was the dominant narrative uh, in, in, around the world. Um, but I was, the more I looked into this, the more I, I thought, uh, I discovered a world in which uh, my sense that power has become easier to get, harder to use, and faster to lose was true. Um, and then I decided to look at different facets. My, I argue, by the way, that this is not just happening with nations or with governments. This is happening wherever you look into organized human uh, undertakings. And that's why I talk about the church and the labor movement and, and, and culture and, uh, of course, the media and, and, and business and the armies and everything. Uh, as I said, um, every human undertaking is suffering from this, uh, these changes. And the data, I believe, is overwhelming. I think that if you start looking at the world with that kind of data, with that kind of mindset, you'll see it. Just think about the sequester here. Think about the fiscal cliff. Think about uh, frustrating, how frustrated we are all watching the most powerful government in the world as a hobble giant, incapable of making very urgent, very important decisions. Then, you know, look at Italy. Italy has always been an extreme of dysfunctional politics and paralyzed government, but n now recently they had an election. And the election, instead of strengthening governance, paralyzed the country. <coughs> 
Last Friday, uh, it was the second anniversary of the Syrian war. And the, and the world, it is obvious that uh, some kind of external intervention will be needed to stop the massacres, the, the killing, the bloodshed. And the world just watches, and there is very little it can be done. Oh, there's, there's, something could be done, but there is no appetite or will uh, to do it. Uh, uh, look at uh, some of the great emergencies that we're facing uh, from climate change to nuclear proliferation to all kinds, the long list of global issues that have become more acute as a result of globalization, global integration, uh, and the internationalization of problems. Um, globalization has uh, created a huge need for collective action at the international level. Their list of problems that cannot be tackled by any country acting alone is growing. The capacity of the world to act collectively is either stagnant or declining. When you combine those two things, in, in economics when uh, demand uh, far outstrips supply, you end up with inflation. In international politics, you end, with, you end up with a lot of people dead. So this gap between the need for effective collective action, either to deal with failed states or global warming or pandemics or the financial crisis or many other uh, causes of human suffering, uh, is met by uh, the growing inability of governments to act together. And that's very dangerous. This is my way of pointing to the fact that what I'm talking about here has direct implications for all of us and very direct consequences for all of us. And by the way, I am convinced that uh, the reason why governments cannot uh, act together collectively in an efficient way is because they are weak, weak at home. In order to coordinate internationally, you have to have very strong mandates. You have to be empowered by your voters, especially, obviously, in democracies. And uh, the landslide victory is an endangered species. In throughout democracies, it's becoming very, very rare. It's rare that a government wins by a large margin. What is typically happens is you end up with divided governments. Out of the 34 countries of the OECD, the, the club of wealthy democracies in the world, out of the 34, only four have an executive branch that also controls parliament. 30 out of the 34 have divided government. That means a prime minister or a president that has to contend with a legislature that is uh, in the opposition. Vitocracies, the capacity of a very varied, very widespread uh, number of uh, actors with the capacity to veto the initiative of the powerful is becoming very common, and not just in government. Situations in which everyone, every player, has just a little bit of power and that enables uh, that player to block the initiatives of others, but no one has enough power to push <laughs> ideas through or to push agendas through. That uh, context of, uh, of government paralysis is the one that uh, is one of the reasons why one should be concerned about this, after noting that there is a lot to celebrate, of course. The end of power and the spreading of competition has created all kinds of uh, very interesting opportunities. More opportunities for, for the young and for the poor and for entrepreneurs and for voters and for politicians and for, there's a lot more of opportunity that we welcome. And a lot of more openness and opportunity for, uh, uh, for groups, that, groups that have been excluded. But again, uh, after celebrating and noting the many good things that this has, it's very important to note the, the downside to it. Uh, the book has a lot of, uh, as I said, a lot of data of what's happening, for example, in the private sector. One of the mo most uh, counterintuitive ideas is, this, is that this private sector that is so wealthy, you know, a world of tycoons and, you know, the Forbes list of the, of the billionaires and all these people that have tens and tens of billions in, in wealth and the CEOs that have uh, golden parachutes and they destroy companies and yet they live with a big check. That's the, f the frame, or our mind frame. But yet, if you look at the numbers, you discover there's a fascinating study 
that shows that a company that was on the top, tw uh, the top 20 percent of its industry in 1980 had a 10 percent probability of not being there five years hence. So more or less, if you got to the top of your industry, you stay there. You were quite comfortable uh, there. Uh, 20 years later, uh, the number has tripled. The number of CEOs, 80% uh, of America's uh, CEOs in the fortune, uh, in the largest American companies, 80% of them were pushed out before the term was over. Japan, who is historically a society where in the private sector you have lifetime employment and you stating in your business and in your company and your position forever, the turnover rates in Japan has also, are also skyrocketing. And in war, in war is also happening. Uh, there is a, another study, another fantastic study by a Harvard scholar called Ivana Regintoft. Uh, he studied asymmetric conflicts, uh, armed conflicts in which one of the sides was weak in terms of uh, size of the army, quality of the weapons, and all kinds of resources. So he compared uh, the, the weak, the, the, the victories of the weak with the victories of the, of, of the strong. And he traced wars, all kinds of armed conflicts, between 1800 to 1949. In that period, 12% of the time, the weak side won. Then he looked at the same uh, asymmetric wars between 1950 and 1998. The number had grown to 55%. So now, in, most, in recent decades, it's more probable that the weak side in an armed conflict wins uh, than the, the stronger side. And what we are seeing around the world is that the nature of war and armed conflict has changed, that, the, that we no longer, the number of international conflicts, uh, armed conflicts between nation states after the Cold War has, has uh, dropped very significantly, but it w has been replaced by different kinds of conflicts. Uh, in which there is not a, specifically between two armies of the representing different na nation states, but all kinds of uh, uh, combatants and insurgents and guerrilla groups and, uh, uh, and, 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 and movements. And, um, and, uh, and, then, and again, uh, those uh, uh, groups, very often very primitive in their weapons and organization, are able to deny victory to the largest armies in the world. Just think about uh, what's happening in Afghanistan with the Taliban. Just think about the pirates that ply the waters of the Gulf of Aden. These are people in very rickety boats uh, uh, used with AK-44s, uh, 47s, and, uh, and RPGs. That they just go out and they hijack some of the largest ships in the world. And the world has reacted. The world has deployed one of the most of the mightiest uh, armadas, uh, very sophisticated uh, warships from uh, the European Union, the United States, China, Ukraine, Russia, everyone is there. And yet the pirates continue to um, regularly hijack some of these big uh, uh, ships. That doesn't mean that these pirates are going to win. What it means is that they are denying uh, the big po armed powers of the world victory. In the same way that in many, facets, in many ways, the Taliban is denying an outright victory to the coalition forces in Afghanistan. So the denial of victory has now become, and the denial of options has now become a pattern more than outright victory as it used to be in the past. And again, that's another example. And examples can continue, uh, uh, you know, in, in labor, in, in labor unions, uh, the, the power of labor unions is also, you can see the same pattern, you can see the same pattern in universities, you can see the same pattern in foundations uh, and charities, uh, in, in foreign aid, where, as I said, wherever you see, you will see uh, this pattern of declining uh, concentration, the, 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 decay of, the decay of power becomes uh, um, a common denominator. Why? Why is this happening? Uh, as it was anticipated, uh, I, you know, the first reaction when, when I say this, well, this is happening because of the internet and social media. That's obvious. Well, yes and no. Uh, of, it, it would be foolish to deny the importance of social media, the internet, and everything that goes with it. But I claim that it is more than that, and it's more profound than that. Uh, the internet and social media are tools and tools need users, and users need direction and motivation. And there are very important tectonic shifts in the world 
that are creating direction and motivations for these users. Um, and a typical, and I think a very powerful example, is what happened in the Arab Spring. We all say that the Arab Spring was the Twitter revolution and the Google revolution and Facebook and all of that. And of course, it played a very important role. But what triggered the, 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 the revolution in Tunisia was just uh, a street vendor in the interior of, uh, of, Ar of Tunisia that essentially immolated himself because he couldn't take any more the abuses of the local government. And that, of course, sparked uh, a, a revolution. And then uh, we know what happened. Uh, what was arrested is still unfolding, and the outcome is uncertain. But the notion that it happened in Tunisia is very revealing. Tunisia is the most successful North African country. Tunisia had the best economic performance in the, in the 90s and in, 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 in the last decade. Uh, it has the largest and fastest growing middle class. It did not have some of the et ethnic and religious uh, conflicts that uh, uh, um, are common in other countries. It had um, a highly educated population. It was deeply integrated with Europe. So it had all of the reasons for, uh, uh, to, to, to be part of these emerging markets of fast-growing economies and uh, rapidly expanding middle classes that could create stability. And instead, uh, because of corruption, because of a government that was not sensitive to the needs and expectations and ambitions of its population, and because of a variety of things, uh, the thing blew up. And uh, I think that the, the, when you start thinking about what is driving uh, this uh, decline, uh, this denial of uh, this decay in, in power, the denial of power uh, into these tyrants, uh, there is a wide variety of forces, and I group them in three in three categories: the three revolutions, uh, the more revolution, the mobility revolution, and the mentality revolution. The more is that just we have more of everything. We have more people and more guns, more medicines and more churches and more military and more of everything. Just think of something and look at the numbers and you'll see that the last 20 years those numbers have skyrocketed. And it's not just that we have, and of course a very important variable is that there is more of us. And it's not just that there is more of us, you know, it took us the whole history of humanity until 1950 to get to have, to have two billion people in the planet. But then, uh, in the last two decades, we increased by two billion people, and now we are seven. Not only are we more, but uh, we are younger. The, this is the youngest world that has ever existed. The number of people under 30 has no precedent. The number of people between uh, 10 and uh, 25 years old um, is three times larger than it was in 1950. So there is more of us everywhere. But it's no longer, not, not just that there is more and that there is, is younger, we're also more urban. We now live in cities. In 2007, for the first time in human history, there are more people in the planet living in urban settings, in cities, than in rural settings. And that has consequences for power, as I will try to explain later. And uh, it's not just more and younger and more rural, it's also everyone is better off. Most people are better off now than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. According to the World Bank, uh, uh, 26 countries that the bank uh, 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 used to call low income uh, now are middle income since 2006. According to the International Labor Organization, 38,000 workers per day were lifted out of poverty in the last decade. And so, Global GDP is now five times larger than it used to be. GDP per capita is three and a half times uh, larger than it was to, used to be just 30 years ago. So there's more, but there's also more affluence. And uh, when you put all of that together, uh, the consequences of, for power are quite uh, uh, amazing. Uh, Brzezinski is fond of saying, or he says in notes, that these days is easier to kill 100 million people than to govern 100 million people. 
uh, governing a small group of uh, people that are spread throughout a large geography, uh, that are not that well off, that are not educated, that are not informed, that well informed. It's much easier to dominate, control, and impose one's wills on these scattered groups than uh, uh, trying to do the same when hundreds of millions of people are living uh, in a much more concentrated urban settings in which they are better educated, uh, better fed, uh, have better health, and of course uh, uh, have uh, uh, um, uh, the, the implications for power are quite, quite uh, obvious. But not, o not only there are more people that are better off uh, and, and younger and everything else, they move. They move all the time. They m move more. And that's the mobility revolution. Um, and everything moves more. Technology and people and uh, goods and services and money and information. Everything mo moves more at great speed and, at, uh, and very inexpensively. And again, uh, the consequences for power are obvious. You know, if you have a lot of people with a lot of stuff that moves all the time, it's harder to control. The end of captive audiences in order to dominate, to control, to government, to impose your will, <coughs> you do need certain kind of control of, of, of space and territory. And all of these, of course, uh, generates changes in mindsets in expectations, in, in aspirations, uh, in, in values, in, in, what it, in behavior even. Uh, one of the most striking statistics that I ran uh, into in doing this is divorce rates among elderly uh, couples in India. It turns out that the elderly in India are getting divorced more than ever, and that those divorces are typically initiated by the woman. And these are, of course, arranged marriages, people that were forced into this marriage 30, 40 years ago. And they're not taking it anymore. The women are not taking it anymore. Why? Well, because they can. Now they can. They know more. They have the material opportunity. They have the opportunity. They are have more mobile. The, the three revolutions. And that is not just uh, uh, in the... Uh, uh, these are not just anecdotes. The, there is a, a study called the World Values uh, Survey that for the last 40 years has been tracking values attitudes uh, around the world in a large uh, number of countries, a large uh, number of people. And it's evident when you track that uh, values and attitudes uh, over time, you see that their movement, their direction, for more intolerance, for repression, for control, for authoritarian behavior, even more tolerance and more need for gender equality. We, with everything that is uh, still pending, and it's, uh, we're still very far where, where, where that should be, still there is, the, at least in terms of attitudes, this world is a much more uh, uh, tolerant world, and it's a much more demanding world in terms of freedom uh, and independence. The more uh, a revolution overwhelms the barriers that protect the powerful, that shield the powerful from uh, the attacks of incumbents and rivals. The mobility revolution helps the rivals circumvent the barriers. And the mentality revolution helps, the, helps undermine the barriers. It's, the barriers are now easier to circumvent to overwhelm and to undermine. And that is at, at root, that is what is causing uh, uh, the decay of power, and that is what is making power easier to get, harder to use, and easier to lose. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Bill Marmon. Uh, I have not read your book, but I did I have occasion to see you on uh, TED, Georgetown uh, 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 presentation, which I thought was very interesting, too. And one of the things you were saying there that you really haven't touched on here is the, the dangers of this, this, this uh, power uh, uh, diminution toward, toward chaos. And you said in the, in the presentation that uh, you think that, that one of the impacts of this will be the generation of new ways that power will be uh, will be uh, will, will be will be held and used, and but you didn't have a chance to say what the sort of the germs of those new ways might be, and I'd be interested if you would dilate a little bit on that. 
Thanks for the question. It's a very good question. Uh, essentially, um, at the end of the book, of course, there is a big question is, so what? Uh, you know, who, who cares about all of this? And I think I hinted at some of it uh, uh, when I spoke about the negative, the downside of it. And then if we want to do something about it, you know, what to do, and that's your very good question. I make a big deal out of uh, uh, bringing a theme that will normally not appear in conversations like this, and that is the need to strengthen political parties. Uh, political parties have had a terrible couple of decades. Uh, and uh, non-governmental organizations have had a wonderful couple of decades. So when I am in college campuses like the one you, you watched, uh, I asked, I tell students, 20 year olds, there is um, a butterfly in Indonesia that is an endangered species. And I'm launching an non-governmental organization to save and fight for this uh, Indonesian butterfly. How many of you can join me, will join me in, in fighting for this? Inevitably, you will find uh, a few hands and they're willing to join. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to Indonesia to fight for, you know, save, save the butterfly. Then after, then I explained, you know, I, make, I made this up. This is, uh, then, you know, let me ask you another thing. How many of you would like to join me in a political party? And they run for the exits, you know, they, <laughs> They, you know, there's absolutely no appetite and there's almost insulting to say that you belong to a political party. And that's very dangerous, of course, because a democracy without political parties and strong political parties is a, a very bad thing. Of course, I am not, I don't have in mind that I'm not suggesting that what I want is the current kind of, for example, in the United States. I don't want what I see in the Republican Party and I don't want what I see in the Democratic Party. I want different kinds of parties, parties that are far more alluring to young people, parties that are different and that have learned, for example, from Al-Qaeda. Uh, not that I want them to become cults that uh, uh, foster suicidal assassins, but there is something in Al-Qaeda in the fact that they are able to attract and retain and motivate uh, young people and to really energize them in uh, favor of changing the world. So what's there? Is there anything there that one can learn and use it in, the, in, in, in favor of the promotion of democracy and freedom and prosperity? or Occupy Wall Street. All of a sudden, in 2600s around the world, camps with tents started mushrooming and, and becoming, you know, all around, you know, why? With people, uh, the same structure, and lead, they were leaderless, and they had the same speaking, uh, talking points, and they had the same, and well, so, m that was a very cathartic movement that they did not end up having a lot of consequences, but there was something there in which people were mobilized and energized and motivated and wanted to change the world and demanded the governments to be different and to de do things. Well, I want that in political parties. And in around, around the world, uh, you, you know that the United States with this uh, two-party structure that has become impenetrable uh, is an exception. Uh, around the world, most of what you find is our electoral machines and groups that create coalitions that are highly opportunistic and work for the elections, and then they disappear. And that's very bad. And, uh, and so one of the areas where I think we need most urgent attention is to strengthen, modernize, revamp, energize, and transform political parties. Hello, thank you for your book. Um, I think you might have answered my question. Um, my question was, um, I think you're arguing the democratization of power that's occurring in the world. But that goes, I guess, counter to the United States motto, you know, out of many, one, which is a concentration of power. And so does our political system, not just a two-party system, but does that need to change or do you think it can sustain what's occurring um, according to your thesis? Another great question, and it's a very sophisticated question. Because what I am, um, 
what I would argue, and what I do in fact argue uh, in the book, is that um, I worry not about the concentration of power, but the lack of power at the political level. Uh, and I think uh, mm, this country and others, or other democracies, are choking on checks and balances. I think because there has been a decline in trust, and that is as well established by surveys and, and the World Value Survey, people don't trust each other. There is a, 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 a steep decline in trust in institutions, even in the Supreme Court, in the politicians, in the media. People simply don't trust anyone. If you don't trust anyone, you essentially try to control them. You say you are not authorized to do anything unless you don't get prior approval. You are not allowed to, the autonomy with which uh, you allow and you endow governments is quite limited. I'm not suggesting uh, that this should not be interpreted that this is an appeal for an autocracy or uh, a more authoritarian, centralized. No, no, I, I want democracy and I want a very vibrant democracy. But I want certain elements uh, that are here in terms of che checks and balances that I think have gone overboard. An example is a filibuster. An uh, example is uh, the ability of certain Congress people to just uh, limit, uh, just, you know, they decide. Uh, that they are going to hold up uh, the workings and the machinery of, of, uh, of government. Uh, and I can go down a list of attributes that are now present that are, I think, in fact, weakening this nation. Well, can I have one follow-up? Sure, um, but I think that with, you know, when information also becomes democratized, people have opinions and they can back those opinions up. And no one wants to back down. Now, in that situation, how do you, how how does a group of people with varying opinions elect an official, you know, to represent them? Because there's nothing to represent. There's just a group groups of small people, and there is going to be a lack of trust. And I agree with you when you said that there's a lot of checks and balances. It's checks and balances on steroids. But what can you do? Because no one in America wants an autocracy or there's too much, people already think that the president has too much power. So what do you do in that situation? Political parties. If you look at the traditional classical definition of what political parties are for, for they, you know, it tells you that they are for interest aggregation, interest articulation, and they also provide a very important training ground for individuals. When you work at an NGO, when you devote all your energy to a non-governmental organization, you can have a tunnel vision. And you can live in a world where it's very clear what's good and what's bad. Saving the butterfly in Indonesia, very good. Not saving it, very bad. And the world is simple. Right. If you are in government, you immediately discover that the choices are not that simple. That very often is not between the wonderful and the horrible, but between the horrible and the very horrible. <laughs> and that is a kind of conversation that is not common in civil society. Civil society, and you listen to the conversations in the book, I make a big deal out of what I call the terrible simplifiers. The idiots that get on television and tell you that, you know, the solutions are it's easy, it's simple. It's uh, black and it's white and I like white. And uh, everyone that likes black uh, is, uh, you know, is not a patriot. That kind of conversation is very dangerous. It's very dangerous. I, it, it, it's part of democracy and we need to accept it and allow it and tolerate it and, and uh, even nurture it. But we need political parties that create, that are very attractive, that is stronger, that, that create conversations that reflect uh, the dilemmas of government. When you are in government, you have to worry about economic policy and pre-kindergarten uh, and kindergarten education. You have to worry about agriculture and nuclear weapons. You have to worry about a whole panoply of things for which very often there are no good choices. And that is one of the functions that a debate inside political parties can help. And also, it, I, I would claim that it will also help dealing with the trust issue in part. Thank you. Hi, my name is Clark Morris, and I just live down the street. And just what a great man to have coming in your, in your neighborhood here. And I really just want to say I uh, appreciate so much your humility and uh, that you talked about at the beginning. It's really refreshing and genuine. So thank you for that that you bring. Um, two questions are not really related. First is, in your research for the book, did you find any indicators or any correlation between kind of global human satisfaction and happiness as 
power is becoming more decentralized. Um, and then the second question, do you think uh, the kind of shaking things up in Venezuela is going to affect Cuba at all in terms of uh, boundaries opening there? Thanks for your comment and the two very good questions. Uh, there is um, the, the term, the theme of happiness uh, is now attracting a lot of scientific attention. And there is a ton of research. There are some wonderful books here you should buy, uh, all of you. <laughs> right? <laughs> About that. Um, uh, there, there was, uh, for a while, there was um, the, the hypothesis or the, the general idea is that happiness and uh, material well-being uh, had a U-curve uh, kind of, you know, it was the more m material, ma the more prosperity you had, the happier uh, countries were. But then after a certain point, uh, uh, it declined. So it, more prosperity did not buy you more happiness. Now there are alternative uh, ways to, to look at that. But, uh, and there is even uh, um, some, the, some very surprising research uh, mm, findings that are quite striking. Uh, on the Venezuela-Cuba thing, that's a, thank you for the question. One of the untold stories uh, that will come to light with much more force in years to come is this extraordinary paradox in which you had a small bankrupt island that was able to dominate and control a country that with the largest oil reserves in the world. The extent to which the Cuban government uh, uh, controls and runs things in Venezuela is unknown and will become known. It is quite significant. Uh, they are the dominant power in the country. Uh, the United States is not the most influential by, all, by any means, uh, the most influential player in the country. And the Cubans are running st things. So I can understand, and you know, the, that book, whenever it's, whenever it's written, will, of course, explain why it's natural for a bankrupt island with a bankrupt ideology to try to get hold of the largest reservoir of oil in the world. So that's not a puzzle. The puzzle is why did the Venezuelan let them? And that's another book. <laughs> Moises, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. I'm going to take the last few words.